all of you to our Financial Inclusion 2020 Roadmap to Financial Inclusion launch webinar. We're really excited to have this moment come after two years in the making. I'm delighted that joining me here are Bill Guida, Global Head of Strategic Partnerships for Visa, Pierre Stein, Director of Access to Finance Advisory for the International Finance Corporation, Evelyn Stark, Financial Inclusion Lead for MetLife Foundation, Tanaya Kalara, Financial Sector Analyst for CGAP, Jasmine Thomas, Program Officer for City Foundation, and Elizabeth Ryan, Managing Director for the Center for Financial Inclusion. We have a lot of wonderful material here and uh, look forward to a number of presentations giving overviews about our roadmap to inclusion. I'd like to remind you all that you can submit your questions using the chat function on the right side of your screen, as Chrissy explained to us. Questions will be read and addressed during the Q&A period at the end of the presentation, but if there are some really great questions, we may uh, invite you to submit them as we go along, and we'll see if we can weave in something a little bit more conversational. So don't wait to submit your questions. We're going to start with the vision for FI 2020, as, as we call it. Could full financial inclusion around the globe be achieved by the year 2020? We at the Center believe it's possible if all the stars were to align and if the obstacles could be removed. And so we've been trying to build a movement that mobilizes key stakeholders around the goal of full financial inclusion. And we're using 2020 as a focal point to clarify thinking and to spark action. We've been delighted to be able to work together with private sector players, regulators, industry developers, technology providers, and other actors. And we're one of the things that we think adds strength to this movement is that there has been such a diverse set of players who have joined with us in this quest. So what is it that we're trying to achieve? What would be different in the world afterwards? We certainly are hoping that we will increase momentum for financial inclusion to accelerate the process that we believe is already underway and to do that in a way that brings attention to the issues of quality and value for customers and protection for customers. So we think that we'll have a clearer understanding about the way forward, greater unity among diverse stakeholders, such as policymakers and providers. Uh, we believe that um, a key to all of this is developing new relationships to promote cooperation, uh, a better role, uh, understanding of the role of microfinance, the, the people who started us off on this quest, how can their role be enhanced in this whole bigger picture of financial inclusion? And then, last but not least, the growth of political will to achieve financial inclusion, which we think ultimately is the most important thing. We believe it's a doable, realistic goal. Um, it needs political will to make it happen. What is it that we're talking about when we say financial inclusion? What is our definition? The first part of it is that it's access to a full suite of financial services. So that includes credit and savings, insurance, and payments. That those services are provided with quality, that they're convenient, affordable, suitable, provided with dignity, that they come along with client protection. That they're provided to everyone who can use them. So that means all those who are excluded and underserved, and that those clients are financially capable, that they're informed and able to make good decisions about the use of financial services. And finally, we believe this will happen through a very diverse and competitive marketplace, that there will be a range of financial service providers, and that that needs to be supported by a robust financial infrastructure and a clear regulatory framework. So that's our, our definition. That's what we're seeking when we talk about full financial inclusion. So a couple of years ago, we embarked on this process of building roadmaps to financial inclusion around five key areas that had been identified by 301 global experts. And those issues are technology, addressing customer needs, credit reporting, building financial capability, and client protection. 
So over the past couple of years, we've had five working groups uh, consisting of about 45 representatives uh, representing countries all over the world. You can see the list there on your screen. And after we went through this process, we said we want to go cast a broader net and see if we got it right. And so we went out to another, uh, another 130 or so people and asked them to review and comment on these roadmaps and help us fix them and make sure we were getting it right. So this has been a product of this ongoing multi-stakeholder process addressing both public and private sector actors. What we've ended up with is really guiding principles to achieve full financial inclusion. And what we've ended up with is something that really is a, a platform for dialogue. We do not think we are done. We do not think we have all the answers, uh, but we hope that we've created something that will be a starting point as we move forward. I wanted to put this into context of the bigger picture of what we're doing with FI 2020. We have Mapping the Invisible Market, which we have previously done a webinar about, and we encourage you to go to our website and play around with the really interesting research and analysis from the Mapping the Invisible Market project. And then we have the Roadmap to Financial Inclusion, and all of this is involved extensive outreach. And all of this is coming together at a global forum that will be held in London October 28th through 30th. And uh, some of you I know will be able to join us there. Uh, we hope many more of you will be able to join us as we look at the post-forum results and begin to move to action. So that is the overview of the Roadmap to Financial Inclusion and FI 2020. And now let's get down to the good stuff. We've had tremendous interest in our Roadmap on Technology-Enabled Business Models, and we're delighted that Bill Guida, Global Head of Strategic Partnerships, Partnerships for Visa, chaired that working group and has been uh, very engaged throughout this process. Bill, walk us through what were you doing for the past year and a half uh, when you were working on this roadmap? Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, again, I want to thank everyone for joining um, this, today's webinar. Obviously, you know, Visa started this process with Citi and the Center for Financial Inclusion almost two years ago because, you know, we, we are and remain committed uh, to financial inclusion, you know, whether it's through um, our operations in Fundamo or with Fundamo in Cape Town our new Visa mobile prepaid product, or just the hundreds of people that we have on the ground in the markets that we all talk about. And so, um, obviously, we were delighted to participate in FI 2020, and particularly in the technology roadmap, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a minute. The second thing I'd like to say, though, is I, I just want to thank all of the working group members. We had great participation representing a, a broad spectrum of, of, of sectors um, related to financial inclusion, really good meetings, uh, really robust dialogue, because it's a complex issue. And I, I just want to thank the, the working group members for all of their participation. Uh, the, the first thing I want to say about the work that we did is I think we realized very early on as, as a working group that it really wasn't our role to solve technology. As, as, as we see, innovation continues and, in fact, accelerates in this space, w whether it's evidenced by what's happened with the iPhone 5 that you now just use your thumbprint to access or a sub-$50 smartphone um, using Android in India, or all of the cloud-based solutions that we see, or the more than 150 mobile wallets that are being launched in the markets that we care about with banks, mobile operators, and in fact, third parties. And so we know that technology innovation will continue apace. And our focus was really try, to try to identify those key conditions that would support the rollout of this technology, that if innovation was gonna continue, what were the areas that needed to support technology in order to continue to reduce the costs continue to make it simple and get it in people's hands in, in the markets that we talk about. And so when we thought about it, it was a very broad topic. We really brought it down to four areas that we thought could create the conditions where, where this innovation and technology uh, could really flourish and, and, and get to the bottom of the pyramid. And, and the four that we identified were enabling a regulatory framework uh, that we realized that it was really important, or, or rather that governments and regulators had a crucial role to play in, in setting up an environment, the building blocks for successful rollout of enabling technology in these markets. And, and I want to say up front, I think we acknowledge that we don't think that we encountered one government that's hostile to these programs. And in fact, every government I talk to supports them fully. It's just 
that much of the regulation that we encounter today was built for an analog banking and quite frankly, an analog telecoms environment. And so we just recognize that the evolution of regulation in this area was required to match the evolution in technology. And so one of the areas that we focused on was regulatory framework. A second was interoperability. We saw that you know, the success of the mobile industry, the success of um, financial services industry has been really based on open standards and interoperability. And, and we know that in the medium or the long term, that interoperability will, will play a key part in, in driving scale and access to services and for financial inclusion as well. The third one, and we really just scratched the surface on this because it's such a big area, is the improved use of customer data and how we can take all of the data that's being generated as we put this enabling technology in people's hands to, to allow them to gain better access to a broader range of financial services, how we can potentially allow them to build financial identities just based on their mobile device as opposed to some more traditional means. And we understand that data is going to play an important role. And then finally, it really is about getting this technology in people's hands as, as innovation continues and, and uh, the distribution was also important. So then specifically, and you'll see this in the report and at the event um, in October, we make a number of key points. And the first one is that we recognize how important technology and its continued innovation are going to be to drive financial inclusion, and that this is going to be an area of focus as we try to achieve our goal um, towards 2020. Obviously, electronic payments is, is really accelerating the drive to financial inclusion, driven by the ubiquity of mobile, but increasingly driven by the access to data as everybody has a browser in their hand, everyone has access to internet, even on very basic phones, and we see that more and more services move from a device and an analog world to a cloud and a very very much digital world, and we recognize the role that, that big data is going to have in, in, in making these services more simple and more rich. Again, we, we're going to make a point in the report that regulators you know, must open restrictions that disproportionately affect the bottom of the pyramid, such as, in some cases, onerous concerns around knowing your customer um, and, and regulations around agent banking and mobile banking. And again, not that I think that Again, I have encountered a, a hostile regulatory environment. It's really just helping the regulators through identifying best practices, um, helping them keep a pace as they think about how best to support uh, financial inclusion because, again, I think almost every government does want to support financial inclusion. Again, interoperability, and this is a complicated one because I think everybody saw that interoperability in the long term is going to be a key driver for both scale and access and the globalization of these services, the ability to cross mobile networks or to cross banks or in many cases to cross borders. But I think that we also realize that there's got to be a, a way that interoperability is implemented that respects the role that the individual participants have made and the investments they've made in these markets. And so the timing and the nature of interoperability, um, I, I think, is, is, is very important. And, and I think that we wanted to ensure that there wasn't a jump to interoperability or a mandate to interoperability before the market conditions um, really warranted it. But we did recognize that interoperability is, is going to be very important. Um, again, we also looked at that in addition to um, you know, general changes in the regulatory processes, that as technology continues to accelerate, that we really are going to try to facilitate or we think there needs to be closer cooperation amongst the other agencies. One of the challenges we have in many of these markets is when you talk about mobile money, it's not telecom regulation or banking regulation, it's both. And in many cases, it involves other agencies as well. And so we recognize that in many of these markets, in order to drive financial inclusion, there's, there's required a higher level of cooperation among agencies that may not have cooperated much in the past. And we see that this is an important factor as, as technology kind of converges uh, around mobile and, and commerce. And then finally, we saw a very proactive role that the governments could play because of technology and the ability to incentivize customers uh, to adopt this technology because of the importance of things like government to people funds, um, universal service funds, international aid disbursements, that in fact, uh, these programs could provide very important liquidity to drive consumer adoption. And so besides regulation, we think governments, if they're effective, can play a very important role in actually driving the success of the individual implementations. Um, this is really just a, a high-level summary of what you're going to see uh, in the report um, if you haven't already started it. And I obviously, we look forward to participating um, at the, uh, the event in October in London, and I hope to see many of you there.
Thank you so much, Bill. And again, thank you so much for your leadership of that really terrific working group. I, we're going to turn right away to Pierre Stein, um, Director of Access to Finance Advisory for the International Finance Corporation. And we've been really honored to partner with IFC on the roadmap to, for credit reporting. So Pierre, take it away. Thank you, Susie. So yeah, IFC and the World Bank has been working on credit reporting for a bit a little over a decade now. And uh, I think it's um, now consensus or very broadly recognized that credit reporting really is a critical building block of inclusive financial systems. It essentially allows to lower the cost of lending as well as uh, allows lenders to avoid over indebtedness uh, for clients. So obviously two very important and critical elements uh, for inclusive financial systems. However, what we've seen more recently is that it is not without challenges to bring credit reporting to the base of the pyramid. And uh, this has really been the work of this working group to see what can we do to extend the benefits of credit reporting more broadly so that indeed we build robust, inclusive financial systems that work for all. And there are really three key challenges that we need to address and that are also part of the roadmap. The first one is that we often deal with a very diverse set of financial institutions that cater to the base of the pyramid. They may not all be regulated financial institutions or banks, uh, quite the contrary. Uh, quite often they are you know, uh, non-bank financial institutions. We may see mobile financial service operators, so uh, a very diverse set or smaller microfinance institutions. So for them to make this work, it often requires changes at the regulatory level to allow them to participate in credit reporting systems, but also it often requires significant investments in their systems to really participate and use the data so it can be incorporated in the lending processes, and it is not uh, an insignificant investment for a small institution. The second challenge revolves around data, in particular the need for alternative data. The issue that we're facing at the base of the pyramid is that the majority of the people that we're trying to reach are unbanked. So they do not have uh, any data yet that is with banks or with financial institutions. So we're starting out from a clean slate when you look at it through the lens of a bank. So there's no bank data here. But all of them have, as we know from portfolios of the poor and other research, um, a large number of financial relationships in the informal sector with landlords, with informal lenders. And so the key question here is how can we tap into this information and bring it into credit reporting systems? And there are certain data sources, and that goes back to Bill's point around the importance of technology, that uh, are easier to tap into, like mobile phone data, right? So there has been a lot of work around how to use transactional data and how do you consolidate that into uh, credit reporting systems so that it can be used to pre-qualify or allow you to access credit much more easily. But so the second challenge around data and alternative data is a key one that uh, no, uh, we need to address as part of the roadmap. And the third and last challenge is really around consumer protection and financial education because one of the key issues that we've seen is that Robust credit reporting systems really require you know, the respect and the focus on privacy, uh, data privacy, and consumer rights, and very closely linked to it uh, require the education that goes with it to really uh, help people understand what a credit bureau is about. In many countries, credit bureaus are simply known as blacklists, right? So they're seen as they actually prevent you from getting access to credit. Well, the contrary is true, right? Because if you can show you have a positive track record in paying your bills, uh, then it opens up doors to become, you know, uh, get much more competitive uh, uh, credit at lower cost and much more easily accessible. And if you look at kind of what is the key driver for credit reporting and why you know, lenders uh, rely on it, it's really not for not giving credit, but quite the contrary. I mean, any market that went through a transformation of making um, you know, different forms of credit more widely accessible and doing so in a responsible manner 
rely on credit reporting at one point of time. But so these three challenges, so how do we deal and allow uh, smaller lenders or different types of lenders access and be part of inclusive financial credit reporting systems? How do we uh, use alternative data as part of those systems? And then uh, how do we increase the focus on consumer protection and financial education are really the key three challenges that we need to address as part of the roadmap to build inclusive financial systems. Pierre, thank you so much for that overview. Uh, I know there are many people, including Syed Mohsen Abed, who, uh, of the Pakistan Microfinance Network, who was a very active member of this credit reporting working group. And he told me that this is one of the most critical things that can truly provide an on-ramp to financial inclusion and advance this issue. So there, there's a, a lot of energy around trying to bring this about. So appreciate your review. We're going to turn to Evelyn Stark. Evelyn uh, has been a very active member of the working group that has changed names several times and ended up calling themselves Addressing Customer Needs. And Evelyn is currently Financial Inclusion Lead at MetLife Foundation. Evelyn, tell us a little bit about your experience on the, the Customer Needs Working Group. Great. Thank you, Susie. And thanks to the CFI team and everyone on the webinar and all those that contributed to this roadmap. Um, at MetLife, customer centricity is a core value. So this work actually really resonates here as well as it does with everyone on this call, I'm sure. The group that worked on this started off by acknowledging all that has already been done in understanding the financial lives of poor people um, and by many of the institutions, researchers, and policymakers who are trying to serve this segment with access to the same kinds of useful financial services that many of us uh, enjoy. That being said, there are gaps in the knowledge and in knowing how to translate what we know into delivering useful, affordable products that customers actually will use over time. And we know that poor people lead complex financial lives and want financial services that help them do very normal things like pay for children's school fees or cover medical bills or meet daily expenses and grow and protect assets. At the same time, we know that the formal sector hasn't figured out how to do this for a variety of reasons, including a difficulty in reaching poor people, communicating with them, and, uh, and of course, finding a compelling business case. The roadmap is very clear that every institution will not be interested in serving every low-income consumer, but those that are will need to be relentlessly customer-centric in their approach. And this really has to permeate all levels of the organization. It cannot be a, it, the job of one small unit within an organization. If the CEO or the chairman of the board is not interested in focusing on low-income consumers, then it's highly unlikely that anyone else down the chain of command will be effective at serving these, roadmap, uh, these uh, markets. So the roadmap does make several recommendations to ensure that um, all uh, levels of the institution are engaged and that there's a bias towards meeting customer needs, towards delivering the right products through channels that are most accessible and least expensive. And for an organization to become really customer-centric, it needs to follow that through with things that might not be as obvious. So we've talked a lot about technology and really understanding how an IT purchase or IT tools are going to be cost effective towards low balance accounts, for example, needs to be taken into consideration. Um, on the more obvious side, uh, marketing has to be clear and simple for poor people to understand and, and be compelled by. And it has to display and be clear about uh, pricing, um, as Tara was also talking about um, the need to, for customer protection. And above all, uh, institutions that want to support poor and low-income clients need to be clear about the business case. They need to know where they can strip costs and where they can't in order to deliver quality products to clients. Um, one of the things that we see working today and that you'll see in many of the recommendations we'd like to see working more and more is having the right players contribute throughout the chain um, the value chain in order to meet customer needs. Policymakers need to continue to be supportive of efforts to promote inclusion, to promote new channels, um, and we need to see 
uh, banks, MFIs, and whole new players continue to enter the market to deliver better products over existing and those new channels. And we need to see donors and investors to focus their subsidies in ways that are intended to help organizations deliver better products for more clients and over the long term. There's still much to do, and the roadmap offers uh, only 10 recommendations, but as everyone will see, they're big ones um, for institutions to consider. And we really hope that the event in London will bring together more experience and more players who are focused on meeting customer needs to uh, really dive into this roadmap. Evelyn, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think the phrase that I was most enjoying of everything you just said was relentlessly customer-centric. Mm -hmm. That's a, a great phrase for all of us to aspire to. Uh, we were really honored that CGAP chaired the Addressing Customer Needs Roadmap process and working group, and we have Tanaya Kalara, who was very engaged in that process throughout. Uh, Tanaya is financial sector analyst for the consultative group to assist the poor, known as CGAP. Tanaya, um, do you have some reflections on your experience with the wor working group? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Susie, and thank you uh, to the center for actually pulling all of us together, I think, around a, around a really valuable process. Um, and for CGAP, actually, this, this process has been really dovetailed very nicely with uh, work that we, have, we were looking to do alongside because we, we created a demand side team uh, approximately two years ago. And when we created it, we really said, okay, uh, it seems like the need is for more customer research. And the more and more we engaged with uh, a broad set of stakeholders, it, it became clear that who you need to have at the center of this agenda is really financial service providers who are at the front line of providing um, providing services to uh, low-income customers. And, and really the challenge there, I think, which uh, Evelyn articulated very nicely, is around translating. So you have these great customer insights, but how do you really translate that into better service delivery on the ground? And so really thinking beyond products to solutions and so that's that's what's been very valuable um, for us to take this journey uh, along with the working group. And really the way we've been thinking about it is to say that there are really three interrelated areas that you need to do, that an institution needs to look at simultaneously. You need to understand customers, but very quickly translate that understanding and actually design effective delivery around it and do it in a way that actually has the economics work or the business case work. And so we've, we've, we've recently started some work um, to actually demonstrate what this looks like. Okay, we say customer centricity, we say providers need to be customer centric, but what does that look like in action? So can we both learn from mainstream industries? You, you have a, your Amazons and uh, Procter and Gambles of the world who have been doing this for decades now and do this very well. What can we actually learn from them that can be applicable to uh, the financial inclusion industry? But then also work with a couple of players in the financial inclusion industry to demonstrate what this looks like in action. So we have a very exciting project actually going on in India right now. Uh, you can follow it on our blog. We just did a blog post on it yesterday. We have a Facebook feed on it. Uh, but that's that's some of the work we're trying to kind of bring uh, together around around this agenda. So thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, participate on this working group and very much looking forward to engaging with all of you in London uh, in October. Thank you, Tanaya. We're going to plow forward to one of the issues that has been of greatest interest to all of the working groups, which is building financial capability and we've been fearlessly led through this process by Jasmine Thomas, program officer at City Foundation. Jasmine, this was this was quite a process you went through. It was definitely. Thank you, Susie. Um, I'm here representing the City Foundation. The foundation is the philanthropic arm of City Bank, um, and our aim is to increase financial inclusion uh, to benefit communities um, where we operate. And right now, we're making grants in almost 90 countries around the world um, to promote financial inclusion among low-income people and improve their economic progress. Um, so as Susie shared um, and Tanaya shared, at the end of the day, it is about the client and the customer. And the Financial Cap work Capability Working Group was made up of a cross-section of 10 experts, researchers, practitioners, and financial services providers, as well as the multilateral and bilateral agencies um, who 
you know, really contributed thought leadership, collectively representing more than 100 years of experience around the world um, to really focus on what is the needs of low-income people and what are uh, their financial knowledge, skills, and behavior opportunities for us to focus and deliver. So overall, we saw the FI 2020, inclusion, FI 2020 initiative as a key opportunity for us. Given the increased attention as well as the activity around financial education and increased shift towards improving consumers' financial knowledge, skills, and behaviors, we saw this as a moment to really clarify and reaffirm financial capabilities definition as well as offering some key principles and recommendations that would help organize and guide the field. So many of the recommendations overlap with other working groups and the material that others have shared so far, as well as what's to come, but I'm not going to go through each of the recommendations that we presented. Instead, I'm going to give you a few key takeaways, actually five, that are for this call, and we encourage you all to read the roadmaps as well as join us in London. So the first, at the end of the day, financial capability is about action. It's about empowering consumers to act in their own best financial interest. That said, it is critical that we reaffirm that financial capability isn't rele relegated to one particular sector, but is the responsibility of all, and it is in the best interest of everyone to help promote individual, household, as well as broader financial stability. You will see over the years, we've seen increased financial education as well as financial inclusion strategies at the government level. We've seen NGO partners, microfinance institutions, as well as a countless number of other financial service providers begin to test uh, embedding financial education within their business models to better understand what business cases exist. Um, and we continue to recognize that these things, these activities are really important to increase research and best practices that are critical to understanding really what are the interventions and initiatives that actually motivates, reinforces, and helps financial habits actually stick. So my fourth point is that at the end of the day, it also is an opportunity for us to better understand the role and impact of technology in building consumer financial capability. As Bill shared, while financial inclusion is a critical um, conversation, particularly among payments, providers and using technology as a key platform, the Financial Capability Working Group really saw technology also as a potential enabler and a lever for building the skills, the behaviors, and enabling people to act in their best financial interests, whether through apps that give you text message prompts to increase your savings for that day or reduce your debt or make a payment that day. All of these things serve as reminders for us to act in our best interest as well as um, promote our own long-term financial outlook um, in a positive manner. The other synergy we recognize as a financial capability working group is that the importance of product design with the features that enable financial capability, as I shared, as increased savings, promoting reducing debt, micro-insurance, we saw all of these as key opportunities to understand how clients were using financial services, as well as what are the ways in which to facilitate their proper usage for uh, people to benefit from the services that are being available to them, as well as teach the rest of the industry where there's opportunities to uh, better serve clients. So my, myself, as well as the Financial Capability Working Group, um, uh, definitely appreciate this opportunity, and we all look forward to greater discussion at the Financial Capability Side Meeting, which will take place in London, as well as the conversation that will continue at the Global Forum. Hope to see you next month in London. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, and Jasmine and, and several other of our leaders have talked about the fact that a lot of our roadmaps relate to each other. It's you, you take out technology and customer needs and all these things, and they all interrelate. And certainly financial capability was one of those themes that went throughout. Another theme that went throughout every single working group was, of course, client protection. Um, that it's not just a race for access, but it's also got to come hand in hand with um, value for clients and client protection. Elizabeth Ryan, Managing Director of the Center for Financial Inclusion at Acción, uh, co-led that working group along with Dave Grace. So, uh, Elizabeth, tell us what the group found out about client protection. Okay, thanks, Susie. I think the starting point for the group on client protection is the, the idea that 
if financial inclusion is going to bring millions and millions of brand new customers into the into the system, and if those customers are going to be lower income customers who are still quite vulnerable in many respects and who may have lower education, that is a very risky situation. Uh, you have a, you have inexperience and you have power coming together, people being given power to use financial services that they've never had before. And so it's very important for those initial experiences of any new set of customers to be positive. Uh, a set of negative experiences can be a major setback uh, in the progress of, of financial inclusion, as we've seen in places that have had over-indebtedness crises around the world. So that's why client protection is such an important piece of, of any strategy for financial inclusion. The good news and the real uh, head start that this group got was that there's a strong amount of consensus around the world on the principles of client protection. And we all know what it means to treat clients fairly, and so we can use that consensus to move forward more quickly. So what we really worked on was the question of how to increase the essentially the political will to act around client protection, because it is really a, a topic that has gotten onto the map fairly recently from the global financial crisis to the over-indebtedness crisis in, in microfinance, um, really putting it on the agenda in a way that it hadn't been in the past. But I think the group thinks in general that, the, that it is not yet quite at the level that it needs to be in order to really provide a secure foundation for clients. Um, and, and so we took the idea that uh, I think has been um, originated by, by others, but it's a great metaphor of the three-legged stool, that three essential groups need to work together to produce the outcome of protected clients, and those three are providers, regulators, and clients themselves. And so uh, let's just take those one by one and look at, the, at, at what we had to say about that. Providers really are the interface between, it's, it's at the interface between providers and clients that client protection actually takes place. And so that means that inescapably providers have the first line responsibility to create positive client outcomes. And that means that, that providers need to proactively uh, embrace and not just put up with client protection. And so our first, our, our first statement is client, uh, Client protection needs to become part of the core professional identity of financial institutions and of professionals working in the financial sector. Um, and so uh, with the SMART campaign as, a, as a, an example of how to take client protection from principles into standards and implementation, we, we uh, first call on providers to, to do that. And, um, within their institutions and working together as a provider community. Uh, but we're also realistic about it, and we, we recognize that there are perverse incentives. It's hard for providers in some areas to uh, go out on their own if they are not being given a very orderly uh, client protection framework in which to operate. And so that is the responsibility of government. And, and yet we see that um, client protection has not been a responsibility of many of the prudential supervisors around the world until fairly recently, and there's a lot of scrambling going on to put effective client protection regimes in place. And so while we know that this is getting onto the radar, and, and I've just returned from a meeting at the Alliance for Financial Inclusion where many of the regulators were uh, putting client protection as the top priority for what they want to build their capacity in. But um, we really want to see the, the level of effort stepped up there. And so we are proposing that the uh, global community adopt a goal and really work towards a goal of uh, effective client protection, regulation, and supervision in every country by the end of this decade. Turning to the last group is the clients themselves, and of course, this is probably the least well-developed aspect of client protection right now. Clients are not organized in a way to assert their rights. Um, 
certainly financial capability building makes a difference, but we're excited about the possibilities of creation of mechanisms that allow clients to voice uh, their experiences and, and uh, much like a trip advisor or a, um, some kind of a way of making public the uh, problems that they have um, in order to uh, allow a feedback loop to take place. And we haven't seen a lot of examples of that yet. The, uh, the Client Protection Bureau in the U.S. has started to publish data, and, and so it's, we see the beginnings of that with, with uh, CFPB. But we think it's a very promising area and want to see more development take place in that area. So the three legs of the stool and political will. Thank you, Elizabeth Ryan. So that was a really fast trip following the progress of the five different working groups to build roadmaps around financial capability, addressing customer needs, technology, credit reporting, and client protection. Obviously, there was a wealth of information that occurred. You can go to our website at financialinclusion2020.org in order to find copies of the roadmaps to financial inclusion and learn a little bit more about what these, this process entails. But first, let's go to some questions. We have just a few minutes, and we have a, a great question that came in for Bill Guida. Bill, the question is, mobile money operators are still leading the development of mobile financial services. So what about banks and microfinance institutions and other players? Are they getting more involved as well? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. So I would say that we are watching um, many more banks um, and some mi microfinancial institutions get involved as the primary leads in launching um, mobile money services. And this has really started, I think, in sub-Saharan Africa and, and parts of the Middle East. At the same time, though, another phenomenon we're seeing, and India is a good example, but there are others, we're starting to see partnerships between banks and mobile op network operators from the start. I mean, most mobile money networks require a bank as the ultimate custodian of funds because of regulation. So there's almost, almost always a bank somewhere in the mix. But increasingly, we're seeing either banks use agents and agent networks to drive their own banking distribution, or as I said, in many cases, more and more partnerships um, between banks and mobile operators. So we are starting to see it move from those first pioneers out, out to the financial institutions. Thank you, Bill. You know, there's another question that came in, and usually we sort of paraphrase questions, but I love how well this was worded, and so I'm going to read it pretty much as is. Uh, and this question is, everyone has highlighted the importance of an enabling and appropriate regulatory environment. Has your group begun developing recommendations for the diverse group of interested participants on how they might work together to engage regulators? It's really a terrific question that gets to the heart of what we've been trying to do, and I think uh, I'll kick that to Beth Ryan. Well, you know, I'm wondering, this is Jasmine Thomas um, at City Foundation. One of the things that we've seen among many of our practitioners, as well as in some of our more uh, regional and global events like the City Financial Times Financial Education <laughs> Summit, is that more regulators are interested in understanding which financial education programs are actively proved to be more effective and have the capability to go to scale. Um, and that means as they're building their national financial education and inclusion strategies, they are reaching out more and more to donors as well as practitioners to better understand uh, what's available to them and how they can be um, a key player in driving inclusion at, in their country. And I would offer that, um, and we're very impressed with what we've seen and right now we know that more than uh, 30 countries around the world have built strategies already. I think the key opportunity is to identify, particularly among the practitioners in the field, the NGO leaders, as well as researchers, is to really give them that evidence, give them that data that is sharing with them the opportunity to implement such a program, as well as what's the technical assistance strategy to make sure that programs not just uh, focus on the Minister of Education, but also the Minister of Finance, and the Minister of Community Development and Social Services so that capability is built within the entire national framework and not, again, relegated to just one agency within a country. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, here are a couple of client protection questions for Beth. Um, and I'll, I'll just give them both. They're both 
uh, interesting questions. One is, should client protection be incorporated into the legal framework of commerce in a given country? That's one question. And another, another listener asked, what about this voice of consumers? That's an interesting point. What role, if any, should there be for NGOs to help constructively communicate the voice of the base of the pyramid consumers, and have you seen any good examples? So two very different takes on client protection, but they make a really good combined picture uh, between the regulatory and consumer aspects. Okay. On the legal side, uh, of course, there already are um, client protections built into basic commercial law, and you know that 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 exists. That sort of framework exists in in every country, and in some countries it's more uh, elaborate than others. But I think we recognize in the financial sector is that uh, basic commercial law does not go far enough and is not specific enough to the to the characteristics that are involved with financial services, in part because financial services are intangible and because they take place over time. And uh, those are some of the, the reasons why you need very specific financial sector uh, con consumer protection laws or regulations. And so in many cases, one of the challenges of consumer protection is to get the legal framework right, and it needs some adjustment and, and possibly some legislation um, underpinning it. You also have a lot of regulatory agency confusion in some countries, in bigger countries, where you have multiple agencies that are sort of not crystal clear about who's responsible for what. Um, on the consumer side, uh, I guess I could refer to Consumers International. It's a group that we've um, had some contact with and, and um, would like to see more of. Consumers International works um, to organize consumers in, in many countries and is, does have a presence in developing countries. It's one of the few organizations that, that does work on, uh, in, on consumer issues in developing countries. And, and in the past few years, they've made financial um, consumer protection um, for financial services one of their highlights. And so certainly we'd like to see that um, progress and grow. And, but I think that really we're, when you talk about the, um, the kinds of client segments that we are looking at, um, women, youth, older people, people with disabilities, there may be a need for special advocacy uh, around them, uh, those special client populations. And so certainly there would be a role in the, the kinds of organizations that work directly with those populations to, to advocate on their behalf. Thank you, Beth. And just a very fast question for Tanaya. Tanaya, what was the name of that project in India you mentioned? Uh, it's a project with a microfinance institution called Janalakshmi Financial Services, and we uh, it's, it's actually up on our blog and our Facebook page. Okay, thank you. Uh, quick question and a quick answer. Bill Gaida, I want to kick it back to you with a question about uh, after the rules and regulations are in place, what are the challenges you encounter when implementing electronic money? Yeah, I, I'd say the, the number one challenge is, is probably around, I'm going to say, marketing slash um, uh, consumer kind of education. Um, again, you know, almost all of the markets um, that we go into um, have a very strong kind of reliance on cash. All the behaviors are around cash-based societies. And, and so while these people have adopted mobile phones um, for social networking, for messaging, um, certainly for telecommunications, the act of converting that money into electronic cash and trusting that you can get it in and out when you want to, uh, that it becomes better than cash and more secure than cash, all of which are true, I'd say there's a, a really big kind of consumer education and marketing um, challenge that, that the mobile money operators have to kind of build that familiarity, build those behaviors build that trust. And then I think once, once that happens, that's when you see the markets where this has been successful take off is, is based on a core amount of education and then a lot of word of mouth. Thank you, Bill. I think that's one of the things throughout this process is that we're posing this question of what would be possible. How, how could it be possible to achieve full financial inclusion for all? And yet we have to start with an acknowledgement of the obstacles and, and how they can be overcome. So thank you for your hard look at those issues. I think it's 
uh, time to start wrapping up. This has been a really terrific webinar. We still have some really good questions coming in. For those of you who are asking some questions that we're not getting to, we will take a look at those and see if they might be some good blog material. And uh, so we'll look forward to continuing the dialogue. Uh, I do want to encourage you to go to our website, financialinclusion2020.org, and to follow us at CFI Acción and, and see how you might become involved. Certainly, we are in an ongoing process to continue developing the roadmap to financial inclusion, and we would benefit if you would review them and comment. I mentioned earlier that we have data that's just waiting for your analysis on our website at Mapping the Invisible Market. We have the FI 2020 blog series that we would love for you to follow, and you can sign up for updates by going to our website. Uh, Adriana Magdas at the center is on hand, and she's also the one who, if you're interested in attending the Global Forum, it is an invitation-only event. And if you're interested in attending, she's the one to contact to explore more. There's one last question on the business case that it would be great to just close with, and that is the question of why should banks and other financial service providers get involved in inclusion? And I just wanted, this is, this is Beth, and I, I wanted to speak to that just as a closing note because uh, one of the other pieces of Financial Inclusion 2020 has been the Mapping the Invisible Market <clears throat> project in which we've looked at uh, demog demographic trends and rising incomes in the developing world. And what we see is that there is a tremendous market opportunity that is emerging uh, all across the world with people who are uh, rising to a level of income over the next decade in which they will have enough income to be able to consider using financial services. It's a tremendous market, and when you combine that with technology advances, we know that there's going to be major leaps forward uh, because the business case is there and it's getting stronger every year. That is a great note to end on. So thank you, Elizabeth Ryan, for those closing comments. Thank you also to Jasmine Thomas, Tanaya Kalara, Evelyn Stark, Pierce Stein, and Bill Guida who have been leading us through the process of building a roadmap to financial inclusion. I'm Susie Cheston, the head of the Financial Inclusion 2020 Project. I'd like to thank you all for joining us and remind you to check out financialinclusion2020.org.